What makes a cup of coffee great? Is it the beans, the machine used, or better yet, the human in charge of the machine? Could it be the temperature of the water, or the exact weight of the coffee grounds? It's believed that humans have been drinking coffee since the 15th century. And as a collective, we've had a lot of time to ponder what it is exactly that makes the perfect cup of coffee. Today, I'm going to show you why it's actually all in the mug. Look. Perfection is something that is challenging to achieve. Coffee is nearly perfect. If you're someone who enjoys the fruits of the earth, but burnt tasting. Mugs. The great containers of coffee are not perfect. There's very few mugs that I would consider to be perfect. And I dare say that I've never drank out of a perfect mug myself. Today, well, it's actually been longer than today. I say today as in today we set off on an adventure to design a perfect coffee mug. But the thing is, I actually already recorded this video once, but there was something on my face. And so I'm re-recording it now. But here we are in my office. I got a jingly bell rock. Use it to relax when I'm thinking about coffee. Anyway, today we're designing the perfect mug. I have designed a, a geonode tool that we can use to iterate on what might be the perfect mug. But first, let's discuss some of the elements that might go into creating the perfect mug. I've traveled around the US far and wide looking for all of the elements that must come together to make a cup of coffee great. What I've discovered is that even if you have a delicious cup of coffee, it doesn't matter if the cup itself sucks. Sometimes the mouthfeel is bad. Sometimes the cup is so terrible, it can't stand on its own one foot and you may accidentally knock it over and then your coffee is gone and it doesn't even matter how good the coffee was because you've you've gone and you've spilled it and it's on the floor that sucks that's all because the mug's bad we are not about that anymore ever again there are things we have to take into consideration when designing a good mug one of them being storage the second being the amount of liquid that goes into the mug this matters a lot because it changes how, when, and for how long you actually partake in the drinking of coffee. The weight and thickness of the mug as it pertains to lifespan and also comfort and ease of use. The material the cup is made out of plays a big part into it, especially when it comes to thermal regulation as well as weight limitations and whatnot. The shape also plays a big part into can you fit your hand in the cup when you're cleaning it out with a rag if you don't want to throw it in the dishwasher. The tilt of the actual walls of the mug are really important because if you're a walker and a coffee drinker and you're walking around with your coffee everywhere and you've got tilted mug walls they're gonna they're gonna start to like get all wavy and they're gonna your coffee is gonna go right out the side of the cup all of these things are important stackability what if you can't stack your mugs what if you have a collection of 13 mugs because a lot of people live in your household and you only have one cabinet to put mugs in and the mugs there's no way to stack them A mug that can be stored 
is a mug that you can cherish forever. So, now, there's one other element to the mug. Arguably the most important element to the mug. I believe that the handle itself is probably the most important element of any coffee mug. Why? Well, the way you hold the mug changes the experience of the mug. The way you walk around with your cup of coffee and the mug also changes the experience of the mug. But the mug is unpleasant to hold. Oftentimes you grab the outside of the mug and you won't even use the handle. And that blows. And you know why that blows? Because that means you're gonna have to wait for your coffee to cool down before you could pick it up or you're gonna burn yourself because the cup's too hot. Here we are in blender. Here's the mug we came up with from my last video, and I want to I want to talk about some of his features. And we could we could discuss this mug and see if there's anything we'd like to change about it and why some of these decisions were made. I want to point out that the interior of the mug is not being defined in this mug generator. Look, most mug interiors should probably be smooth, linear, and uniform. This mug generator works on the exterior profile of the mug. It happens to extrude that profile inwards, which creates a duplication of the exterior walls of the mug. The interiors just note they will be smooth and they will fit the rough profile of the mug. This was the first mug design because parallel mug walls overall, I believe, really damn bright. Turns out my light's really hot and melted the tape. I don't have a real light set up. The parallel walls are awesome because what happens when you're carrying around a cup of coffee all day is that the liquid will rock back and forth. Having a mug with the walls tilted in like so, this is an unpleasant drinking experience. I actually own a mug just like this. And don't worry about the handle being detached. That's something we could easily fix later. I have a mug like this and it's unpleasant for a few reasons. One, it's great because the coffee rarely spills out. It's got a wide base, which means that you're not going to spill it easily. It doesn't fit in most coasters because to get the 14 to 16 ounces of liquid in the cup, the base is going to be too wide. The other part is that oftentimes I don't like throwing my mug in a dishwasher. I drink coffee all day or tea all day and sometimes I switch back and forth between the two. So I just want to rinse my cup out and then take a napkin and just kind of out the interior of the cup, just clean it out. Just give it a little swoop. If the cup is like this, it's kind of hard to fit your hand in it. So it's relatively unpleasant. Some people like having cups like this. This also is a nice, pleasant cup. You could see the liquid easily. It's kind of aesthetic, right? It's, it's a visually pleasing cup, but then walking around with it, it's a lot easier for that liquid to splash over the lip. I think this cup, I prefer even more to the sloped inward cup, but the best of both worlds is really just a cup with parallel walls, just vertical parallel walls. It's simple, but it works. And it's simple and it works for another reason as well. We can make the base of the cup the exact radius so that it slips into the top of the cup perfectly. And if we go and we duplicate this, if you were to store this cup, they would just sit on top of each other. That's an underrated feature. That's a feature that every coffee cup should probably have by default. Now that we've gotten that detail out of the way, the other thing is the drinking angle. Because drinking out of a perfectly parallel cup is okay. Honestly, drinking out of a slightly flared cup is a little bit more pleasant. If it's too flared, the coffee is actually gonna pour out too broadly because of the flare lip, and it might go off the sides of your mouth, might drip down your chin. That sucks. The other solution I've considered is that you have some sort of bubble inside the cup and you could have a slightly round cup like this. And I think that's okay. It's maybe a little bit less aesthetic. We take it back into this professional lighting. It's, it's a little bit weird. If it was maybe even rounder, then it starts to get hard to clean. So I did consider this and I think this does make a good coffee cup, but it's weird. And then you also have the other problem of when you're pouring the coffee into your mouth, you have to overcome quite a large basin. So you're going to be pouring the coffee pretty far for it to get over that lip. I think having a really small lip 
that doesn't affect so much of the pour when you're actually drinking your coffee is important. Now, in terms of the dimensions of the cup, we've gone with a nearly one to one design here, meaning the actual diameter of the cup is the same as the height of the cup. This came after much experimentation with different width to height combination ratios. I believe this ends up being nearly the ultimate ratio for a couple reasons. One, again, something that keeps coming up is you could fit your hand inside the cup, which makes it easy to clean. To some of you, you might not understand why this is as important to me as I make it out to be, but as someone who drinks at least two cups of coffee a day, as well as four to six cups of tea, I'm reusing the same cup a lot and I am constantly wiping out any coffee residue or tea residue from within the cups themselves. So when the cup is small, I find this annoying to do. And when the cup is oddly shaped, I find it even more annoying to do. The second thing is I'm flailing around often. I'm flailing all the time. I flail everywhere I go. But the thing is, it's really easy for me to knock over a cup of joe. If we look at this cup right here, this cup was quite nice, but the problem is, is number one, it's a bit on the smaller end. I believe this is at least a 14 ounce mug, which we'll discuss the size in a minute, but it also has a very small base to it. Number one, you can't stack this mug in storage, which is a little bit annoying. Number two is that when you place it down, while it fits on most coasters, which is an important metric as well, it's really easy to knock over and it's really easy to shake. If you were to slam your hip into your desk for some reason or another, you might lose your whole cup of gel. We don't want that. One other issue is that if the cup is too wide and short, let's just pretend for a minute that no matter what size we make this cup right now, that it is going to hold 16 ounces of water. The pivot of your hand is on this cup and the weight of the cup is quite far away from your hand. And so the wider the cup is, the heavier the cup will feel to the user because the weight of the cup is being offset and placed away from your hand. So the closer we can keep the weight to your hand, the lighter it will feel and the more control you'll have over the cup itself. We don't want to go wider than one to one because the cup is going to start to feel really heavy and unruly. If we go narrower than one to one, this is actually okay. There is some room to play around here. You could do something like a maybe 1.3 to one and you get a little bit of a taller mug. This is okay. And I think this comes down to personal preference where I believe it's a little bit easier to stack mugs in storage that are a little bit shorter. And one other preference is I like to be able to see a broad surface area of whatever liquid I'm drinking. I think it's interesting to look over at my drink and go, wow, there it is. Why 16 ounces? Why not 14 ounces? Why not 12 ounces? Why not 18 ounces or even 20 ounces? As a child, I believed the 20 ounce mug was actually the ideal mug. And all of the cups I had were nearly 20 ounces. And if they weren't 20 ounces, I went and made cups that were, my light's falling off again. It's a piece of paper taped over a desk lamp. I would make my own cups, 20 ounces. And the thing is I would fill them with a monumental amount of liquid. The problem with this is Number one, your tea cools down or your coffee cools down before you can finish it usually. And if you do finish it before it cools down, you're probably going to have to go pee a lot. This is not so bad if you're working salary because you get an excuse to use the bathroom quite often. The thing is, though, now I realize that the more opportunities I have throughout the day to go refill my mug with a different cup of tea or coffee, it's like a mini break. So if the cup is too big, you don't get to take breaks as frequently. And it's kind of weird to have as many cups of tea. We talk about the handle now as the last most important thing. The handle is personal preference. Now, there's a couple different ways to hold a cup. There's the classic. I have dropped so many cups of coffee. I don't trust myself to do anything but grip this coffee with all of my might until my knuckles turn white. There's the, I'm going to hold my mug like this because my hands are cold. I need to warm myself like a poor orphan child. There's the three finger grip, which is similar to the four finger death grip, except for the fact that you can keep your pinky out if you'd like to maintain your class while drinking. There's the two finger grip, two over, two under. This is my preferred grip because 
I find that it creates a nice lever when you are walking around with a cup of coffee. It's easy enough to put your thumb up here, easy enough to grab the cup of coffee. Your wrist gets a nice angle to go up or down. If you have three or more fingers and you're carrying around your cup, you're really craning your wrist up, right? Like it's really like strain to walk around, but with two fingers, there's really not that strain. And you get to support the cup down here. And then there's the one finger in, one finger up and one finger down. This is my other preferred method for drinking coffee. And I think this works great when the cup of coffee has gotten a little bit low and it's not so heavy anymore. If a cup of coffee, this, this is actually a pretty decent handle because it's not sliding. I usually use a, a mug from Starbucks that slides and it, it it's, it's similar to this cup except instead of being rectangular it's more of a C shape. And what ends up happening is when you're using your cup of coffee it will slide down your fingers. And so that's something I'm actually trying to correct for with this cup here because this cup is sort of a hybrid and I've tried many different approaches. I tried adding in a little step here of sorts for your finger to rest in. So you can put two fingers in here, one finger under here. And I think there's something to this design. And you know, the danger is that this is so far in that you end up with a similar problem to the three finger grip, which is that your wrist gets cranked. And if that inset is so far in that you're going to have nowhere to kind of structure and balance the cup off of. If it was very slight like this, it could be nearly perfect. But after simplifying the design a little bit, it's possible that just having, you know, something more or less like this would really just work out and this was after you know much deliberation in the last video but again that video is tarnished because of the uh, thing on my face and then a smooth kind of rounded area for your finger to sit in nicely something i'm realizing is having a divot here for your thumb to go in is really nice because you could slide your thumb forward if you lift your hand up your thumb still fits and if you lower your hand your thumb still fits so what I might do actually for this design is add in slight change where we lower the connection point here and we add in joint here. Ooh. Yeah. But I think this needs to be moved forward and this needs to be rounded a bit. Interesting. This might be an improved handle from the last one actually i think this is better so now you can slide your thumb forward a bit the other thing we elected to do is the width of the handle it has to be wide enough that you don't get a unstable grip you don't want the coffee to be able to rotate back and forth so you, you need this cup to be wide enough now we went for a rounded square handle design because it allows for a good amount of surface area but you're not really losing the comfort of it being kind of too sharp around the edges and then the thickness is such that it fits easily between your fingers but it's not so thin that it feels delicate in any way the last thing with this handle is that if you were to do this type of grip it creates a perfect place for your index finger and your middle finger to rest it's a nice angle so that the weight is equally pushing down on your finger and back on your finger and so you get kind of a equal distribution of weight on that bottom finger as well as a nice gripping point now more than ever for your thumb one of the other considerations was that the handle is not too far from the mug you do want to be really careful where you put the handle itself because if the handle is too close to the mug you risk burning your fingers on the mug when you actually fill it for the first time that's quite risky but if the handle is too far from the mug you risk the fact that all of a sudden now you're going to be so far away from the center of mass that the mug is going to feel extremely heavy and so it's very important that you get as close to the mug as possible with your grip position as far as adding design to the mug. I think a cool design around the mug goes a long way in making the mug feel good. When the mug looks good, you feel good about the mug. But that is for next time. Because now that we have what I believe is a pretty solid profile for this mug, we actually need to put it to the test. And so in the next part of this video, 
I'm going to take everything we discussed here today and I'm going to attempt to remake this mug nearly one to one in clay. I will be going into the ceramic studio and I will be hopping on a pottery wheel and attempt to throw this mug exactly to these specifications. Thank you all for watching today's video. I really appreciate it. As I said, the format of these videos is subject to change over time, given that there isn't a format for these videos and they just happen as they do. I would love to hear what you have to say and what your thoughts are on what would make the perfect mug. Until next time, peace out.